Well, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Wyant, the founder and editor at AgriPulse Communications. And I'm so pleased to have you join us this afternoon and see such strong interest in our topic, Farms Under Threat 2040, Choosing an Abundant Future. We're really looking forward to discussing a new report from American Farmland Trust, which is it's being released right now. They look at rapidly disappearing farmland and ranch land and map three alternative futures out to the year 2040. This webinar will highlight the findings and what they mean for the future of agriculture. So today I'm gonna to make some brief speaker introductions and encourage you to dig into their full biographies on our website. We also want to hear from you, the attendees. So feel free to offer your questions in the Q&A portion at the bottom of our screen, not the chat box. If you are experiencing any technical issues, feel free to use a Q&A function to let us know you're, and our team will assist you. In addition, if you're not able to watch the full uh, show today, we're gonna have this recorded and uh, the webinar will be available later on today at agra-pulse.com. I'd like to begin our program by thanking our sponsor, American Farmland Trust, and welcome our first speaker, the president and CEO of AFT, John Piotti. Now, under his leadership, AFT has engaged in the most comprehensive study of American land use ever conducted. They've helped secure an additional 200 million per year in federal funding for agricultural conservation easements and launched new initiatives that advance environmentally forward farming practices and support next generation farmers. Previously, Piotti served in the Maine State Legislature where he chaired the Agriculture Committee and was later elected House Majority Leader. Welcome, John. Thanks, Sarah. It's great, it's great to be here. But before I begin, I want to convey our a deep appreciation to the Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS. Without their support, this research would not have been possible. I also want to thank conservation science partners, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the Farms Under Threat Advisory Board for all their time, energy, and expertise. So let's, let's dive in. Imagine a farm with rolling hills and fertile fields. Picture the weathered but resilient barns, the healthy woodlands, the, the humble home. Perhaps the same family has been farming this land for generations, pouring themselves into the hard but happy work of good stewardship. Now imagine a for sale sign planted right in the middle of that front field. For whatever reason, the owners need to sell. Economic struggles could be the cause. After all, making money to keep a farm viable can be a constant battle. Or perhaps the current farmers are retiring, the situation that will impact 40% of American farmers in the next two decades. Their life savings rests with the land itself, so they must sell to pay for retirement. They may have even been a member of the next generation who would have loved to have farmed this land, but the numbers simply wouldn't work. So the farm is sold to a developer. And rather than planting seeds, builders are laying foundations, preparing to grow sprawling houses or office parks or warehouses in once fertile fields. Yes, we need places to live and work. When well done, development can be good, helping build strong, livable communities. But we need farmland too. We can't keep developing open fields just because it's easy or convenient. Once a farm is chopped up or paved over, it is gone forever. This is not some hypothetical thought exercise. We are losing farmland in this way all across America. It's occurring outside booming cities like Nashville and Austin and Charlotte and Denver and Phoenix, Columbus, Sacramento, St. Louis, the list goes on. It's also affecting rural towns and counties where five acre lots and 10 acre lots are rapidly replacing once viable farms. Why is this so important? Well, food security is a life and death issue for billions of people. In recent events, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, widespread drought, they've all added to this threat. 
the mounting effects of climate change and the rising global population will make it even harder to ensure a stable food supply in the coming decades. We must safeguard the land that grows our food. And yet it is about more than food. Wisely managed farmland and ranch land provides a wide range of essential ecological services from water recharge to wildlife habitat to carbon sequestration. Simply put, our future depends on the land in so many ways. American Farmland Trust has conducted the most comprehensive study ever undertaken of the changes in agricultural land use here in the US. Between 2001 and 2016, the United States converted over 11 million acres of agricultural land. That equates to 2,000 acres every day. These numbers, while sobering, are not a surprise to many of you. We shared these figures two years ago when we released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States. Since then, we've taken the next step Rather than just looking backwards to see what farmland we've lost, we are now looking forward to project how the loss of farmland could affect us in the future. Our findings suggest the urgent need for a more thoughtful, equitable, and sustainable path forward. Our new report is called Farms Under Threat 2040, Choosing an Abundant Future, because it's all about making good development choices now that will give us the future we want and need. We've projected three potential scenarios. The first scenario, which we call business as usual, assumes that we will continue developing farmland at the current pace. If we do so, another 18.4 million acres will be lost by 2040. That's an area nearly the size of South Carolina. Of this total, over 6 billion acres will be converted to urban and highly developed land uses, such as commercial buildings and moderate to high density residential development. The remainder, over 12 million acres, will change to low density residential areas, both large lot subdivisions on the urban edge and scattered houses in rural areas. While new development is necessary as the population grows, this level of conversion will use more land than needed. Such poorly planned development undermines the economic viability of our farms, global food security, and the environment. It pushes up greenhouse gas emissions by lengthening commutes and reinforcing car dependence. And because the conversion is concentrated near cities and towns, it will have an outsized impact on smaller farms. It also places an undue burden on local governments, costing more for public services than it provides in taxes. Continuing on our current path means that six states will convert over 10% of their ag land, threatening the future of farming there. More than 20 counties will convert over 40% of their remaining farmland. Perhaps most concerning, nearly half of the conversion will occur on the nation's most productive, versatile, and resilient farmland, what we call nationally significant land. This business as usual scenario should alarm us, but our team has also modeled an even more alarming scenario, one that is possible if we don't mend our ways. We call it runaway sprawl. In this scenario, New development unfolds in an inefficient and wasteful manner. Low density sprawl dominates the landscape with large lot housing tracts consuming massive amounts of farmland. Farms are gobbled up on the edges of cities, both large and small, which is often some of our best land. And in the West, new developments compete with farms and ranches for water, dividing communities and straining delicate ecosystems. The runaway, small, the runaway sprawl scenario projects that by 2040, over 24 million acres of farmland, over 1 million acres every year will be lost or compromised. This figure includes 12 million acres of nationally sig significant land. In this scenario, Texas, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia 
will convert over 1 million acres of ag land, while California and Virginia are not far behind. Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island will each lose over 17% of their remaining farmland. And in many cases, this development will overrun small and mid-sized farms that serve local markets. The two scenarios I've just described are deeply concerning, but we don't have to resign ourselves to this kind of development. There's another way forward. We can build better. We can protect farmland and support the farmers who steward it. We can stem climate change and conserve water. We can help usher in a new, more diverse generation of farmers and ranchers. Or to put it more simply, we can save the land that sustains us. Our third scenario called Better Built Cities employs these values to model a future where we develop with care and conservation in mind. In this projection, farmland conversion would be cut by over 7 million acres compared to business as usual and be cut by 13 and a half million acres compared to our runaway sprawl scenario. Saving those 13 and a half million acres would support over 82,000 urban edge farms, produce 7.9 billion of annual agricultural output, and provide 184,000 on-farm jobs. But the better built city scenario does more than just protect and support agriculture. It also helps towns, cities, and their residents. With thoughtful, efficient, and equitable development, local businesses can thrive on main streets across America. We can live close to our jobs, schools, and friends. Rather than driving any, everywhere, we can walk and bike and use public transit to get around, reducing air pollution and saving money. Neighborhoods can become more livable with the diversity of housing types and price ranges, and parks and greenways can be planned or improved to connect us with nature. We can all play a part in making this vision a reality. Developers can revitalize urban spaces, and build compact communities rather than wiping away wider and wider expanses of farmland. All of us can support farm-focused land trusts and buy locally produced food. And if we own farmland, we can consider protecting it with an agricultural conservation easement so that our land becomes a legacy that feeds future generations. We can also push for better public policy at all levels of government. This means encouraging smart growth through comprehensive planning and sensible land use policies, advancing redevelopment and infill development that lessen the development pressure on farms. It means doing more to permanently protect critical agricultural land, incentivizing farmers to keep farming, and enacting the Uniform Petition of Heirs Property Act to help those families who have joint title retain ownership of their beloved farms. And it means advancing smart solar siting so that we can promote the much needed acceleration of renewable energy while still protecting ag land. Where possible, we should be putting solar on rooftops over parking lots and on brownfields and marginal land. And when solar does go on good farmland, we should be encouraging agrivoltaics or dual use solar promoting soil health measures under the arrays in requiring strong decommissioning standards. Forward thinking policy must also embrace equitable farmland access. We must accelerate use of proven farmland transition, transition tools, farmland programs, affordability mechanisms, strategic tax incentives, and targeted technical and financial assistance. These can support the next generation and help ensure that farming reflects the diversity necessary for a vibrant, resilient, and inclusive food system. The bottom line, there is much we need to do and no time to waste. We face a challenging future when combined with global pandemics and brutal wars and the devastating effects of climate change, the impending loss of farmland puts us in a bind but we don't have to stand by and watch our farmland disappear. 
We don't need to accept this as some inevitable fate because it isn't. We can choose a different path. We can choose abundance. We can nurture hope through action, working together to cultivate the change we need. Let me make a critical final point. I frequently encounter people who aren't alarmed by the current or potential loss of farmland here in America. They either think that there is some inexhaustible supply of farmland elsewhere, which is not true, or that even with farmland loss, America will still have plenty of land to feed itself. That part may be true, but it is the wrong way to view it. America is blessed with 10% of all the arable land on this planet, more than any other nation. The world beyond our borders needs food grown here. We can't think of American farmland as just a natural, national resource, but a global one. Let's return to that hypothetical farm I described earlier. Instead of a for sale sign in the pasture, let's imagine a sign proudly stating, this farm is protected forever. Let's imagine a viable operation that produces food for the community and a community that in turn supports the farm. Let's imagine a future for that farm full of opportunity and vibrancy. Now, let's turn from imagining to acting. I'm asking you to read our report, reflect on what's needed, and then roll up your sleeves and get to work. Together, we can bring this vision to life across this nation. I want to spend just a moment mentioning some of the work AFT is committed to doing. We are growing our national agricultural land network to provide more resources to help land protection professionals and state departments of agriculture. We're placing even greater emphasis on farmland protection, farmland access, and smart growth in our policy work, both in the upcoming Farm Bill and through our work in roughly 20 different state legislatures. We are doing more to support interested landowners and communities and organizations with innovative approaches to transfer land to new, more diverse generation of farmers and ranchers. We are also advancing smart solar siting through research and on the ground partnerships across the country. And finally, we are doing more to help promote farm viability especially for urban edge and historically marginalized farmers, because a financially successful farm is itself a powerful check against sprawl. There are two things you can do right now to join us in the effort. First, you can sign up for a state-specific webinar to learn what Farms Under Threat 2040 means in your state. And second, you can join AFT's policy team for the release of our policy platform for the 2023 Farm Bill. That's scheduled for July 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for your time and your commitment to the cause. Thank you, John. It's really a pleasure to hear all the great things in your report. Next, I'm going to introduce our three panelists and gain their perspectives on this important topic. You'll see them all on the screen here shortly, but I'm gonna make brief introductions of each one of them and then call on them to make some comments. First off, it's my pleasure to introduce USDA Chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, Terry Cosby. His career has spanned more than 40 years with NRCS. He's held numerous leadership positions and staff positions, and most recently served as NRCS state conservationist in Ohio. He worked there for 16 years. His conservation and agricultural roots run very deep. He grew up on his family's cotton farm that his great grandfather purchased in the late 1800s. Cosby earned his Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Education from Alcorn State University in Alcorn, Mississippi, the nation's first Black land grant college. Following Chief Cosby will be our next speaker, Ambassador Kip Tom. He's CEO of Tom Farms, LLC in Leesburg, Indiana. 
He previously served as a United States Ambassador to the United Nations Agencies for Food and Agriculture and Chief of the U.S. Mission to the UN Agencies in Rome from 2019 to 2021. He oversaw the largest contributions to UN food programs and dealt with emergency assistance, safety standards, agriculture, fisheries, forests, and rural development financing. His diligent efforts to modernize agriculture and increase sustainability have enhanced U.S. objectives in both foreign policy and agricultural priorities. Our final panelist is Catherine Burgess, who is a Vice President of Land Use and Development at Smart Growth America. She oversees SGA's land use programs, including LOCUS, the Foreign Based Codes Institute, and National Brownfields Coalition. Previously, she led the Urban Resilience Program at the, the Urban Land Institute. An urban planner, Burgess has, holds an MSc in regional and urban planning from the London School of Economics and a BA from Williams College. So starting off, I'd like to welcome Chief Cosby to add some of his perspectives on this important report. Chief Cosby. Sure, thank you. And thank you to John also. I'd like to thank American Farmland Trust for a very strong report. Now this builds on a long-term and ongoing partnership between NRCS and AFT. Since the mid 1990s, we have worked together to carry out and share research related to farm loss and protection. This latest report will help NRCS and the country plan for the kind of future we want to see. One in which our farmland and ranch land resources are protected and continually providing the public benefit we depend on. Environmental protection, open space, wildlife habitat, and a stable food supply, just to name a few. It shows how important it is to take steps now as soon as possible to protect farmland and ranch land. The NRCS works across the country to permanently protect farm and ranches with voluntary agriculture land easements as part of our agricultural conservation easement program. We do this in partnership with public and private entities who work on the ground with landowners. Throughout the history of the NRCS agriculture easement program, we have assisted and placed in five 1,334 easements on nearly 1.7 million acres, an additional 516 easements covering another 435,000 acres are currently going through the process, and that's really important. So we're on our way to over 2 million acres of farm and ranch land permanently protected. We work with, in partnership with the Department of Interior and the Department of Defense on the Sentinel Landscape Program. Since 2013, Sentinel Landscapes have worked with private landowners to permanently protect over 515,000 acres and implement sustainable management practices on an additional 2.7 million acres around military testing and training areas. These efforts have preserved wildlife habitat, boasted agriculture and forest production, and reduced land use conflict around military bases. Given this report's finding, and the potential for, seven, for 18 million or even 24 million acres of agricultural land to be converted by 2040, these programs and partnerships will remain the key to the success. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today and I look forward to the next segments. Thank you, Chief Cosby. Next, I'd like to start out with a question for Ambassador Tom, and I see that we do have several questions coming into the Q&A portion as well, so we'll try to get to additional questions as time allows, but Ambassador Tom, you've been doing a lot of work to help Ukrainian farmers even before, uh, uh, you know, as, as they deal with the Russian invasion, but even before that time, there were a lot of situations that you witnessed when you were based in Rome of all these areas around the globe that were suffering from food insecurity because they didn't have the land, the resources, or the ability to produce their own food. Tell us a little bit about what you witnessed and some of the political turmoil that can result from the lack of access to uh, good farmland and food production. Well, thank you for that question, Sarah. Uh, global food security is actually passed a tipping point and now nearly 350 million people are facing some level of food insecurity and another 45 million are on the brink of famine. 
Drivers of this decline in food security are typically man-made conflict. Uh, in fact, that is over 65% of all food security uh, related. The most immediate example is what we are seeing in Ukraine, as you mentioned. Ukraine is a major breadbasket of the world, feeding many across the Sahel and Africa, where now some nations are down to a 30-day supply of wheat. And Ukraine is expected to see a decline of over 50% in their production in 2022, and likely even a greater reduction in 2023, and a world loss that we cannot afford. We will likely face the consequences of an Arab Spring much greater than what we experienced in 2008 and 2011. And we know the lack of ability to afford or access food causes people to migrate, becoming one of 30 million people. Uh, they get caught up in human trafficking, illicit drug trade, arms movement, and worse yet, joining terrorist organizations. This is a threat to our national security and that of our allies and friends. We can add climate change, the lack of adoption to modern innovations such as biotech, flawed public policies such as the EU's Green Deal Farm to Fork Initiative, which will lower productivity nearly 20% and increase food costs by nearly 90%. This policy, which is an indulgence of the rich, it is scientifically indefensible and is morally indefensible. Even here at home, we're considering some of these options. So it's time we look at our resources here in the United States, our farmland, and make sure that we protect it. Thank you. Thank you, Kip. Appreciate that. I'd like to turn to Catherine here just for a second. Catherine, you're an, an advocate for smart growth. And that, that doesn't mean zero growth. So tell us about your organization's approach to development, and how that fits with these, the report's uh, findings and how you're planning to build better cities. First, thank you so much for hosting me and thank you to the American Farmland Trust for this excellent report. I think it's a terrific resource for advocates everywhere. Um, so my name is Catherine Burgess and I'm the VP for Land Use at Smart Growth America. And we're a national nonprofit and our North Star is a country where no matter who you are or where you live, you can enjoy living in a neighborhood which is healthy, prosperous and resilient. And a lot of the ingredients to that puzzle are you know, walkable development, mixed youth development, mixed income development, affordable housing, and transit, and complete streets, streets which are designed for people and cars and bikes to all get around as opposed to looking at the needs of cars um, above all else. Uh, so smart growth, you know, we look at the neighborhood scale and we also look at growth regionally. And I think that this report is a terrific resource in that, especially given how it looks at smart growth as one of the many tools to protect farmland and to protect our uh, nation's abundant, uh, abundant, abundant land and food security. So, when uh, I was also really uh, excited to see in the report that you are not only looking at development scenarios on account of you know the the housing need and the housing supply crisis in this country, you're looking at uh, some of the different extreme weather and climate change outcomes, which will change development patterns. So look at how, looking at how sea level rise and extreme weather will both impact agricultural practices and will impact our cities and the development of housing and the preparedness of housing for peak weather events. So I think there is a currently, you know, there's currently a housing supply crisis. The Biden administration is doing a lot to address, address this crisis. There was a housing supply action plan recently, which has a lot of terrific mechanisms for um, supporting the development community to build the housing that's needed. But there is still much more advocacy work to be done to ensure that new housing is built in locations which is supported by transit and which will contribute to this regional planning pattern that we are all advocating for. So. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. Um, John, there are a lot of questions coming in. Some are just about the parameters of the report that hopefully um, folks can go look at the report that we've posted on in the chat. They can download it. But uh, just as a top line here, uh, Larry wants to know whether your analysis looks at prime farmland only or all farmland, and also wants to know about how water availability factors into farmland loss. 
Uh, great, great questions. So we have looked at all kinds of agricultural land across the country. I, I think we, you and I both mentioned that this is the most comprehensive look at agricultural land that's that's ever been undertaken. Um, but we obviously look at uh, different soil types and uh, uh, the classifications of prime and soil of statewide significance and the like are some of the underlying layers. But we've gone beyond that. Um, for a hundred years or close to it now, we've had the designation of prime soils have been very useful to think about things. But um, we've taken that a step further with a, a set of national experts and have developed a, a benchmark for this uh, so-called nationally significant land which looks at not only the soil's uh, capabilities for productivity, um, but also um, for resilience and for versatility. What kind of crops can you grow there? Will this land um, maintain viability in light of uh, a changing climate or water loss and the like? Um, so the simple answer to Larry's question is yes, we look at those things, but we've actually even gone further. Um, now, with regard to water, that's uh, particularly interesting. Um, the study that's out now is outlining three different scenarios going forward. This fall, we're going to be coupling that with a, a national climate model. Um, and as, uh, as rainfall patterns change, that's going to have a huge bearing on farmland. There's a lot of farmland right now, which is very productive if it's irrigated or very productive given current um, weather patterns, but may not be in the future. Um, so the second part of Larry's question, the answer is yes, we have some of that in this report and there'll be a lot more in the report coming out this fall. Thank you, and I'm, I might add that we've been writing about this quite a bit on our, especially in our Western editions, because California, as you know, is going through a third year of drought, and mm. so that is idling quite a bit of farmland, and there's a, a, several questions about how that might be used in the future if it's going to have to be followed from lack of water. So um, Chief Cosby, turn to you for a second. You were in Ohio for 16 years. You know that corridor the, that runs across the state through the, the heartland. And, and you've seen, I, I know I recently drove through Columbus and there's heavy development uh, pressure. There's big box and retail stores going up. How can NRCS staff really try to be more proactive and utilizing the information from this report and help local landowners try to pr protect as much farmland as possible. I, since becoming chief of NRCS, I've, I've driven that corridor a lot more recently and seeing the effects that you're talking about. I think one of the things that we heard that's in the report is talking about repurposing some of this land that was already on the development. That's gonna be real important. Seems like we see a lot of, of, of new development but they're moving from places that have already been developed. So why is that? Why can't we go back and repurpose some of those areas that have already been developed? You know, do whatever we need to do there to make sure that we're not bringing more land into production. And you're correct, even where I live uh, outside of Columbus, uh, we have these huge warehouses and different things that are going on prime farmland. And I, it, it, I, it, it's hard to see it happening, especially when you look and these places are moving from places that were just right across that may have not been prime farmland, but they're moving to a new location. So I, I think we're going to have to do a better job. Uh, we work a lot on the urban areas. We're going to have to do a lot more with cities and councils and, and, and public officials to talk about the advancement and how this is going to affect us as a country moving forward. The other thing I want to say is we plan to use the report to to support a lot of the strategic planning efforts at the national, state, and local level that we're going to be going through as an agency so that we can make sure that we're working where the need is greatest. You know, having high quality data like what we're seeing here uh, showing the threat to farmland and ranchland across the country will be hugely helpful for us and no doubt for partners who are applying for our programs. You know, given the findings, it looks like demand for agricultural land is only going to continue to grow. And we like that. 
So one of the things that we're going to be faced with is, is that we can only reach so many because of the type of funding that we have and the funding. But I think it's but there's going to be a huge need here um, to, to continue this funding. You know, the report can help us assess future needs and make sure that we're doing everything we can to serve farmers and ranchers. Like I said, we're gonna we're gonna be have a huge demand. And I'm hoping that in some kind of way we can meet that demand from the public to protect this land. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, uh, one of our questionnaires didn't leave a name, but wanted to know what programs are there available to connect younger farmers with those who may be retiring or thinking about retirement? Uh, you actually have a whole suite of programs at NRCS. Would you care to share a few of them that that uh, applied to this uh, topic? You know, we have we have a number of things there and, and that, that we have. We have our agricultural land easement programs that you know, we've been very successful from, you know, looking at stuff with private citizens as well as working with a lot of our entities to protect a lot of this land. We have what we call the Regional Conservation Partnership Program that's, that's available. So there's a lot of things that are available. You know, we also have this beginning farmer network that, that we talk about uh, through USDA where, you know, there are some things that we can do for folks that are becoming first time farmers and, and helping them, you know, from uh, developing conservation plans to look at land they may want to buy, also financial help they can have. We also have these programs out there that provide financial assistance. Um, and so the big thing that I stress is if you're interested in any of this, stop into our local field office, talk to our local staff. We have 2,500 offices uh, across the country where, where we have expert planners that'll come out. And, and work with you on this conservation plan. And, and, and the thing I want to stress is every acre is important, no matter if it's in the rural area or the urban area, every acre counts. And so we write this prescription for the land uh, to make recommendations on resource, how to solve resource issues and resource problems. And then we present that information to the land user and they can you know, follow that prescription and a lot of times we learn things when we work with the landowner because a lot of these folks have been on the land for so long. They teach us how to protect and preserve a lot of these areas. So there's a lot of things available here. Uh, we just hope that folks will stop in and talk to our local, local experts. Thank you, Chief Cosby. Kip, I want to turn back to you because as a farmer yourself, uh, you see also the development pressures around Indiana, but lately with your focus on Ukraine, it's not really um, a concern to some farmers there that are getting bombed and they can't get their grain out of the country to be able to sell it. Uh, how, from, from your perspective, how does the struggle that we're seeing in Ukraine heighten our awareness, if at all, to this, this importance of food security? Well, Sarah, I, I, look, I look at the U.S. agriculture and food system, and I say we are probably the most reliable and durable food system in the world. And that is based around an ecosystem of, of our natural resources, uh, being our land. It resolves or, or revolves around uh, our universities and land-grant universities that have given us the research and the technology tools to uh, help farmers produce more on less. We have the private sector that does a lot of research and development. And uh, then I look at our rivers and ports and our climate. Uh, there is no other place in the world that fits what we do in agriculture nearly as good as we do here in the United States. So it tells me the dependency upon U.S. agriculture will only grow into the future. If we think this is our last man-made conflict, uh, we need to understand this has always gone on. And we know the impact of this climate. And the U.S., our farmers and ranchers, seem to be the quickest to adapt to new technologies and innovations to make sure that we can have that reliable and durable system that I mentioned earlier. And as a follow-up to that, one of our questioners wanted to know mm -hmm. about the role of AI and robotics in agriculture. And I know you, am, <laughs> you are already involved with so much of that. Could you just give us a taste of some of the uh, innovations that have made things easier on Tom Farms? Yeah, machine learning has been an important component in our operation. We've probably been using many of these uh, for 12 to 15 years. Uh, understanding what's going on in your farm on a micro basis of uh, having a fingerprint for every 10 square meters and understanding the, 
the nutrient level, uh, the water holding capacity, uh, what variety produces the best in that area, and being able to measure, monitor, and control uh, and improve processes on an annual basis incre increases productivity and lets us actually take some of those soils that uh, may not have been good producers in the past and make them very reliable producers for very productive soils today. I'll also say that, you know, we have labor resource issues in agriculture and that's where, you know, we're seeing some of this automation come along the line and help us uh, be a more effective in running our operations and make sure we can scale like we need to. But again, uh, U.S. agricultural producers and ranchers are the quickest in the world to adapt to technologies that have a positive impact on the environment, our soil health, and our ability to feed and fuel and clothe the growing world. All right. So this is John. Can I just add on to that for a second? Um, Kip's absolutely right that we have amazing um, farmers and ranchers in this country, and they're um, they're very creative and they're 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 very productive. And he also alluded to the fact that we still see productivity increases in in farming and food production, which is great, uh, wonderful. Um, I'm I'm glad we do. But the reason I want to highlight that is a lot of people think. That's the answer. Um, they, they dismiss the need for farmland because they think we're going to grow ourselves out of this through productivity enhancements. Um, and as I said, it is wonderful that we continue to see productivity enhancements, but that, 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 um, that trend line is, is, is not as sharp as it was um, during the, say, the Green Revolution. Um, and, um, and, and beyond that, we have a rising population and we have a whole large number of people on this on this planet who are not having currently an adequate diet. So I, I just, though it's wonderful we're seeing these productivity enhancements, I don't want anyone to think that that doesn't mean we don't need all of our farmland. We do, and it's only going to be more important in the future. Absolutely. Um, so, John, I actually had some other questions for you, too. Um, Lynn Henderson from Agri-Marketing is weighed in, and he's uh, living in Iowa. Uh, he wanted to know about farmland that's selling for $15,000 an acre as farmland and $40,000 an acre as development property. How do you say no to that? And I, I thought this might be a uh, an opportunity for you to talk uh, and address also another question that came in, and that is, uh, how do farmers benefit from conservation easements and, yeah. and how, how do those things fit together? Yes, those two items do fit together. Well, uh, uh, Chief Cosby mentioned uh, the federal ASEP program, Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, which has been uh, so effective. Um, there are many states, 29 of them, I think at this point, that have some kind of a state program for purchase of agricultural conservation easements. And what an easement allows is an opportunity for a farmer to extract the value, the equity that they have in in that land, but keep the land in farming. Um, yeah, so it's it's actually a very powerful tool, um, and it's always voluntary. It's only for farmers who want to take advantage of it. But as as Chief Cosby knows, there are more farmers who are interested than there's traditionally been 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 money for it. But where it can work, and I, I speak as someone who have an ease, has an easement on my own property, um, the way it works is a piece of property has a value as developable land, um, and then it has value, usually somewhat less, as, as farmland. And the value of the easement is the difference between the two. So rather than selling that land in Iowa for $40,000 an acre, that farmer could potentially sell an easement on that land for the difference between the 40,000 and the 15,000. They could get paid potentially $25,000 an acre if, if those are the numbers for that particular parcel. Um, and then they could use that money to reinvest in their farm operations. It, it, it is both a, what we refer to as a farm viability tool. It, it, it allows farmers to free up equity to reinvest. It's also a farm transfer tool that is really important because when that land ultimately exchanges hands, it will do so at its farmland value because now there's an easement on it that doesn't allow it to be protected. So easements provide a very clever way of dealing with that situation your, the, the, the viewer from Iowa dealt with at the same time that it 
provides cash to farmers um, to help invest in their operation and makes it easier for the next generation of farmers to, uh, to afford the land. Thank you. Um, I had another question come in for Catherine about um, the role of urban agriculture and farms close to urban areas. And um, anybody else that wants to comment on this as well is welcome. Um, can, can you, Catherine, share a little bit about how urban agriculture uh, might be involved in some of these uh, smart growth opportunities? Absolutely. And I'd also like to um add on a bit to some of John's points in the previous conversation around the um, you know, potential for single family development on current farm sites. Um, so I think for urban agriculture, you know, it's first it's difficult to generalize. Obviously, every community is different, every site is different, and in each neighborhood, the needs are different. I see a community, uh, you know, community-based urban farm sites can be a key element of green space and an opportunity for community health, community building, and uh, it can be part of the um, ingredients to make a mixed use, mixed income neighborhood really come together and bring people together from different households. And so having these sorts of civic amenities, I think are really important from a quality of life and a public health perspective, and they make it more attractive and exciting for people to live in yeah, higher density neighborhood situations where maybe not everyone has a large private backyard. And so I think it's important to look at urban farming, you know, both as a tool for food production and as this tool for community cohesion and for encouraging a type of land use pattern, which can lead to, uh, you know, longer term regional vision for growth with compact urban settlements and protected farmland. Um, something I'd like to add to as well, where we're talking about the, um, you know, the high potential value for uh, farmland conversion over the, you know, big picture, something we're quite focused on is zoning advocacy and zoning reform. And right now, you know, across the U.S. around, um, this is a generalization, but I'll, I'll put it out there as a, you know, kind of, a, a, you know, big picture statement about three quarters of our communities are default zoned for single family residential large lot development. And so that is what it is easy for developers to build. And so something that we are focused on is looking at policy reform, incentives, and other mechanisms to make it easier to build mixed use transit oriented mixed income developments on brownfield sites in existing community centers. So the default doesn't have to be that larger lot suburban development, which can, you know, uh, really quickly uh, overtake, uh, both overtake a lot of land and lead to more driving, more emissions, and have all sorts of environmental impacts. So those are a few big picture thoughts on that. And if I can jump in here, and Catherine, you know, brought up some important points, I would just talk about urban conservation a little bit. Uh, I think you will know doing the last farm bill, urban conservation was introduced into the Farm Bill. And NRCS is taking the lead on that for USDA. And we've established 17 urban offices across the country. And we're looking at, you know, how do we be a little more, you know, helpful. And I, you know, I've been involved in urban agriculture for a long time, um, working in Cleveland, Ohio. And it's amazing what urban agriculture can do to some of these cities and some of these communities how it can change it socially, uh, economically. You know, I saw I saw people uh, with hoop houses and selling their local grown fruits and vegetables and going to college and buying their first home. You know, it, it's amazing how this can work. And so when I made the statement earlier that we got to look at also rural as well as urban, we got to put urban into this conversation. You know, there's a lot of people that want to grow local and buy local. Uh, we have all of these homes and all these areas in these cities that are be to being torn down. You know, one of the things is we have to go in and make sure those soils are safe to grow fruit and vegetables, but there's a way to do that. And in RCS, we, we have an urban office now uh, under USDA. We have a new urban director at, at NRCS, and we're going to be working with a lot of these cities just because they don't have, have been recognized as an urban city. 
we are still going to provide that service. One of the things I'm doing is I'm putting urban conservationists, urban specialists in a lot of these cities so we can start having that conversation with the local uh, municipalities on how urban agriculture can play a huge role in what we're trying to do here. Terrific. John, did you want to comment on that as well about urban agriculture, John? Well, only that it's, uh, I would agree with uh, uh, Terry and Catherine, how important it is. I think some people sometimes dismiss it as being, um, you know, such a small amount of overall production. But what it what it does is it connects it connects people with food. Um, it opens up um, a, a mindset of both understanding where their food comes from and recognizing the incredible work that farmers do to produce that carrot or produce that onion. Um, so it has real value on that level, and then it also has just really helped invigorate um, uh, uh, cities and and and, and towns. Um, it's positive in so many ways and we need to uh, I think farmers are really good at recognizing that agriculture is a system and that we need farms of all sizes and all types um, I sometimes don't think the general public gets it the same way they want to they want to focus on one kind of farm or another kind of farm that they happen to like but the truth is we need agriculture of all scales and all types to have the resilience that we're talking about Yes, we've got uh, one of our questioners pointed out that uh, they remembered when we used to have a real in incentive during our previous world wars to have victory gardens and wondered if that should be an, a national policy once again. Um, so we've got a lot of other questions. I've got 42 that are sitting here looking at me and I'll, I'll try to get as many as I can, but just grouping a couple together. Uh, one came in from a former uh, chief, uh, Bruce Knight, who was asking about uh, solar and what developers uh, might be willing to do uh, in terms of working with AFT or working with NRCS, working with landowners to, to have this mixed or dual use. Um, what things are you hearing from solar developers? Is there an interest in, in having um, stronger participation like that? Um, what can you share, John? Or, or yeah, please? there's there's an awful lot going on in this place and it, uh, this uh, uh, space, and it it varies from region to region. I think the the Northeast, for whatever reason, was sort of uh, ahead of the game on on this. So Massachusetts, for instance, has solar standards that uh, encourage and provide incentives where uh, dual use is is undertaken. And for members of the of the audience who don't know. Dual use is um, a, a situation where you will have farming and solar panels on the same site in some way, which is is truly synergistic. Um, it might be it might be grazing of livestock under panels that are more sparsely spaced. It might even be crops that are are grown in in concert with 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 panels. Um, but we're beginning to see interest around around the nation. AFT uh, uh, is is working with Rutgers on some research. Uh, University of Massachusetts as well. It's still kind of an early uh, space that we're in um, of figuring out how to do this in the best way. Uh, but at the same time, there's this freight train of, of, of interest in moving towards solar. And we're um, unfortunately losing a lot of really good farmland under solar panels. And at AFT, we are, we are all about um, giving farmers um, options for diversifying their income and, and recognizing they have the right to go any path they want. But we want to make sure all the tools and all the information is out there. And we specifically use the term smart solar because it's analogous to what we've been talking about today of smart development. AFT is, even though we're all about protecting farmland, we have never been against development. We've been, let's put the development in the best places and save our best farmland for farming. And we feel the same way with solar. Um, uh, there are opportunities to put solar on marginal land, um, put solar in on brownfields. That's not going to create um, all of the solar that we probably need to meet our renewable energy goals. Some's going to have to go on farmland, but where we do put it on farmland, let's be smart about it. 
Um, so AFT has considerable resources on this. Um, people who are interested should look at our website and far more will be coming because this is an area that's just unfolding. Um, and uh, USDA um, has, is getting into this space. I applaud uh, Chief Cosby and his colleagues uh, for recognizing the importance of this. Department of Energy has a real interest in it. Um, this is going to be a critical item um, in the years coming going forward. And just to piggyback on that, I think it gives, gives producers a lot of options. And we're all about options, as John talked about. And what's best for your farm? What, what, are, what, what are the things you can do there for your farm viability, as well as assisting the public on their viability? So I think that we're going to have to look at everything available to us, all options. When you talk about you know, vertical growing and some in some of these things, there's a lot of options that we're going to have. And we're going to have to take a look at all of those because, you know, we're talking about this huge population growth over the next few years. And we're going to have to have those options available, especially if we have these, these other countries that are going to be dependent on us for, for their viability also. So we're going to have to be looking and taking all options under consideration. Um, Kip, would you um, comment and just follow up on that a little bit on some of the other countries that are becoming more and more dependent on our production, what you've seen? There's no question. You know, we'd like to see productivity gains across Africa, the Middle East. Uh, there's a lot of work being done trying to engage the private sector to increase that productivity. We're trying to make sure the right public policy is in place to allow that to happen. At the same time, when I look back here in the United States, living in uh, the communities that I do that uh, have a, seem to have a desire for solar, uh, we're losing significant quantities of farmland, not for dual use solar, but just for solar. So uh, I really appreciate everyone else's comments talking about some of these other plans, some of these other options, but uh, it really bothers me when I see a solar farm going up and I know the need across the Atlantic Ocean or across the Pacific uh, for that food that will no longer be produced on that farm anymore from those quality soils. So um, I'm like John, we need to have smart productivity gain or smart productivity when we look at solar and same with our cities and towns growth. So um, let's make sure we do it in the right way because we got a hungry world. Catherine, um, any observations from you in terms of working with solar development and part of your planning? I think there is a, you know, tremendous potential for solar beyond, you know, what is currently in place in the US and, you know, we're not, it's, um, we're increasingly seeing both more uh, municipalities in terms of urban development requiring solar and or requiring different green building um, uh, opportunities. So I wouldn't, um, I, I am definitely, I was eager and interested to see the resources that American Farmland Trust offers on how to um, sort of productively co-locate. So. Great, and that brings up another question that some people have asked. Again, the link to the report is in the chat area. Um, John, just last question for you before we wrap up. Folks want to get involved. How? I mean, we've talked about so many different areas today. Uh, how do they start? Is it local, state, federal? How, how do they jump in here? Yes, is the answer. <laughs> all, all of the above. I mean, there are so many places. It really did depends on what position you're in. If you're a landowner, um, I suggest exactly what Chief Cosby said. Um, go and make sure you've knocked on your local NRCS office store and, and see what um, options are there. Um, all of us as residents need to be involved. Um, I was the chair of a local planning um, board in my town for 25 years. Um, there are so many decisions that are made at the local level that have an impact on land use and, and thus have an impact on agriculture. So you can get involved there. Um, your, your purchasing dollars make a huge difference. Where do you, where do you buy your food from? Um, so that's all important. And, and then I'd be remiss, uh, my, my communication staff would kill me if I didn't say a, another answer is um, become a member of American Farmland Trust. We'll help keep you informed on all things. And 
and uh, at the risk of being commercial for a moment, you'll get one of our, our great No Farms, No Food bumper stickers. Actually, I shouldn't say this, but you, we'll give you these for free, even if you don't become a member. Um, but there's so many ways to get in, engaged. My, my only request is I think people often become, uh, they get one side of information in agriculture and they, and they think they have all the answers. And the truth is it's complicated. And as I said before, we need farms of all types and all sizes. So um, get engaged, fight for farms and agriculture, um, but don't get myopic about it. Um, we, we need all of agriculture to be successful um, and to uh, um, make sure we have the food and the environmental services that are future demands. Well, thank you, John, not only for your presentation, but for your sponsorship. Thank you, Chief Cosby, Ambassador Tom, Catherine. Uh, great discussion today, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, for those of you who would like to watch again or would like to uh, watch parts that you might have missed, we will have this video posted on agri-pulse.com. That's our website for AgriPulse. It is not behind a paywall. You can just scroll around and, and look for that. If you were a uh, registered participant, you will get a push when it was uh, an email when it is available. So uh, please join us later on for a review of this important discussion. But with that, I'd like to close out and thank all of you for participating. Have a great rest of your day.